Hi, I'm Reed. Welcome to Begin With Bones, a series on campaign construction for both players and DMs. I'm Reed, and this is Crowland Publishing. First up, this channel is 100% about homebrew. It's about 100% making the world your own. It is about a creative act that has no end goal aside from the pleasure and enjoyment of you and the pleasure and enjoyment of your players. But I think there's a lot of advice on how to make and build a campaign that isn't so much wrong as it is. There's a lot of stuff that's just unnecessary and a bit asked backwards. So I think the first thing that people run into troubles with is world building. So this is how it usually goes. You run a few games, you feel okay about DMing, you feel you've got a basic handle on the rules and how to run a characters and how to handle um, uh, player dynamics. Now it's time to make up your own adventure. This is the source, man. So you sit down, you open up your notepad, you open up your word file, and you get to work. This is how God felt on the first day. This is the juice. So you're right, you start it up. You're at 1,000 words. You're at 2,000 words, you're at five, and it's gold. You write about the gods, and you write about the dragons, and you write about the ancient stab lord who was thrown down by the heroes a thousand years ago, and now he waits in his ancient prison, and you write about the holy paladin orders, and you write about the last stand of the god of evil, and you write about the good queen who was loved, and you write about the war that reshaped the world, and you write about the rise of the beholder gangs, and, uh, and it's pure, and it's magical, and it's pretty unnecessary. Now, before we go on, there's one thing that I do need to just clarify. World building is really, really fun. World building is a pure act of creation. And if you do it, I bet you will have a great old time. And if you haven't done it, you should try it. And if you have done it, you already know what I'm talking about. It is a joyful act. It is a moral act. And as an enjoyable act to that is enough to sustain and justify it. So please do not misunderstand. I am not scolding you or anything like that. I'm not telling you not to world build. I'm saying that you don't have to. And I'm saying that sometimes it can get in the way of a game. And here's a few important reasons why. So I think the first reason to avoid world building is just a very, very practical one. It's putting the cart before the horse. Um, the most important thing in an RPG, the most important thing that you need to be aware of as a DM is the players. Nothing happens without the players. The second most important thing in the world is the characters. And now there are responsibilities of the players to the DM and there are responsibilities of the players to the campaign and to the world. And we'll get to that in time. But before you build a world, you have to be aware that you are there to facilitate the creation of a good time for your players. If you don't feel like you're doing those sort of, for want of a better word, hosting duties, the stewarding duties, you're probably not going to have a good time as a DM. What you're looking to do is to create challenging and emotional experiences for your players, not build a world not create a story, not show off your imagination. Because here's the thing, is that, is that cool and challenging and emotional experiences like you're trying to give players, they're much stronger when they're a collective and collaborative experience. So what am I talking about? Here's an example. All right, so you might spend months and months just working on a world that emphasizes, say, wilderness and the frontier. You want to create like um, a world that has collapsed the empire has fallen, and now primarily you ex you imagine that the PCs will act as agents of law and act as agents of civilization, and they will be restoring the grandeur of the lost um, empire. They will be exploring that now rugged wilderness, the monster haunted fringes of the world, uh, and the, you imagine sort of that there will be a uh, kind of an overplot of creating a, an alliance amongst all the good guy races of the world to reclaim everything. That's pretty cool. That's a good solid hook for a campaign. You imagine that there'll be a lot of rangers. You imagine there'll be a lot of druids. You imagine that, you know, um, the rogues will all specialize in being outside stealthy rogues and all that sort of stuff. 
you get really excited about it because that's what you do when you when you're world building you, you you get into it you think about it you, you're planning about like um which alliances are going to work which aren't you're looking about who's a good monster who's a bad monster and how they're all going to relate to each other you're thinking about uh, how the players are going to go and build bases for themselves and you know like little bastions of civilization it's gonna be sweet but your players have all been watching a kung fu show and they all want to be monks they all want to go and you know be doing kung fu stuff they want to be taking on you know like evil wuxia bastards or maybe they've been watching a show about vicious medieval politics and they come to you and like oh well, we'd all like to be in a noble house please we'd all like to you know go to a ball spurring in people's ears you know like i understand that her grace has quite lost her mind with that sort of stuff but you've presented you know and you've worked on go out into the wilderness and fight a bear so what do you do do you force players to play in your world where well, you can but that's probably going to be a bit of a doomed campaign or do you work with them now you probably want to work with them right i know i would so you know campaign world your frontier world and goes into a lonely folder on the computer for another time and you work with your players now i'm not saying that you can't pitch a game to them and we will get to it in time you know how to pitch games to players i'm saying that when dm expectations meet player desire players probably should win most times it's sad but you know like it's a man's life in the dm's army let me tell you a story about what i mean about how player desire should probably come first a few years ago, I was working on what I thought was going to be my piece de resistance. I was, you know, really getting high on the whole, this, this is what they'll remember me for, you know, which is nonsense, but it's fun. So you do it. And I'd set up this kind of like Magitech, super high fantasy world, um, real sort of final fantasy, you know, um, seven sort of stuff, um, airships flying around and magical technology and all the rest of it and the players were basically sort of super heroic um just playing around with ideas and then godbound would come in and do much much better a few years later and things were going great i was really really enjoying the, the experience and then something sad happened i remember i was showing the players a map that i'd drawn i'm a terrible artist it was just a sort of a series of sketches and i remember one location that i was very very fond of um, was the Black Buddha and I'd, I'd done up a wiki I'll try and find it I don't think I'm not even sure if it's still around but I'd done up a wiki and I'd done all the cool locations and factions and stuff like that and I put in you know it was about 15,000 words work and then I wrote up for the for the Black Buddha I was like I was I was really reading a lot of Kenneth Grant at the time so it was all up on Clipothic Nightside stuff and it was all like you know, the Black Buddha is the is the incarnation of Doug Dugil, the anti-mother, and you know, really getting into that Typhonian current of, of creepy, you know, real world mythology. And I was very, very proud of it all. It was like the the Rakasha fiends created the Black Buddha from the dark energies of the nightmare during the Hell Crusade, and it condenses against the walls of reality. While the Black Buddha exists, all of creation is at risk as it works to slowly destabilize the bonds between essence and blah it was on and on and on i was very excited by it i thought it was going to be such a cool location and such a cool baddie players didn't care it wasn't that i did a terrible job it wasn't that i was bad at creating stuff it wasn't that they were mean and being bastards it's just that not everyone wants to or will or has the time to or the energy to want to read pages and pages of backstory for nothing else if nothing else they have work they got school they got boyfriends or primarily their main artistic focus in an rpg is their own characters that's what they care about the most 
And I think that, that there's an important lesson here in that if you want to write a novel, write a novel. But an RPG is not the place to show off your creative chops. Not primarily. An RPG is to work with people to facilitate their artistic vision, which is their players, which is, sorry, which is their characters, and your artistic vision, which is the world, and all of that coming together through the focus of, or through the medium of game, and through the facilitation of the players having a good time with each other. So, world building is not guaranteed an audience at all. And in fact, if you overworld build, it can actually lock players out of the creative process. Let me give you an example of how I myself have overly world built and how that can lock out players, which in turn makes my world not as good as it should be. I, my personal preferred sort of fantasy world is a sort of roughly 1700s early modern gothic horror fantasy that is what i like i like weird old castles i like graveyards i like mysterious women in white with blood-stained lips i like shapes flapping across the moon i like villages with pitchforks it's what i like i like a hammer house of horror fantasy it's not my only type but it's what really, really sparks my engine. But if ever I'm designing that kind of world, and I've you know, made about four or five of them, I tend to struggle with barbarians. I find that I, I, they don't really fit into that particular world. They can, but I just, I struggle with them a little bit. And more than that, monks. Uh, the whole wuxia kung fu character there's only one example in all of pop culture of um, uh, Eastern Gothic sort of coming together that I'm aware of, which is Captain Kronos Vampire Hunter, which is not the best film you've ever had. But people like to play barbarians and people like to play monks. Do I lock them out? No, of course I don't. But I work with them because there is a source of novelty that will inform my world building. So a barbarian, you know, like the last barbarian that we tried we sort of um uh we flavored him as a kind of eastern european hussar um a wild man whose rages were like um bizarre trances of dances of the people of the steps kind of stuff um so there is room there is certainly room for you to listen to and work with your players and if you have decided beforehand yes no this not this you are doing yourself a disservice. Overly world building is going to cause you problems. And there's one other argument against overly world building, and that is that, simply put, the best and the most memorable thing that you as a DM can create in your campaign world, in any RPG setting, D&D, Call of Cthulhu, Fate, Bunnies and Burrows, Paranoia, is characters and relationships between your characters and the player characters and the relationships between players and each other you will get far more um, mileage and far you will give far more enjoyment to players if you are focusing on not creating like you know this is the god of justice, the stern god of justice. This is the maiden who is the goddess of healing and joy. You will get far more mileage out of creating a mentor. You will get far more mileage out of creating a school bully, out of a, um, a friendly local priest, a drunken old fighter who's you know haunted by nightmares, your father's mistress, the tribal shaman. Rich characters like that will excite players and they will want to talk to them. They will want to see them. And most importantly, they will create character-driven drama. Oh my God, they've taken Ugg, the local shaman. We must go and save them. Oh no, I think that my mother is a vampire and my dad is a Frankenstein. 
That's what you want. That's exciting. What do you mean your dad's a Frankenstein? <gasps> that means you're my half brother. Oh my God, players love that stuff. If you can create like a local sinister clergyman or an absurd fail son, rich baronet who messes with player pans out of jealousy or foolishness or fecklessness or a local witch who lives just outside the village who no one likes who's weird and creepy and old and disgusting, but she did patch up the rogue that one time and she did know an awful lot about the green fiend in the woods. Hmm, who is she? If you create a rival adventuring crew, if you create like an eccentric old warlock who lives out in the forest up a tower, you know, looking up at the stars and going like, oh my God, it sees me. You know, they, players will really, really relate to that. Far more than to any kind of like, you know, 2000 word essay on the fall of the Titans. The Knoll who's turned his back on evil and who just wants to be accepted by the town is going to be way, way more effective than anything else that you have can create in world building because players will remember it, players will directly interact with it and players will create an emotional involvement with it. Creating a rich cast of characters is really really rewarding and will have a lot of payoff so that is a primary area where i highly recommend the dms focus a lot of energies and there's one other reason that i suggest that you don't get too stuck into world building and it's because most fantasy games especially dnd and pathfinder and the ones that try to recreate heroic fantasy specifically have an implicit set of assumptions that make the world and the rules work they're not demands. You can work around them. You can change them. You can have a D&D world without gods, for example. But it's an assumption that you will. So here are a few. You know, like you, you'll find your own. But um, the game takes place in a romanticized version of the past. Supernatural forces like gods and magic are demonstrably true. And humanity exists in the context of other intelligent races and we are not the apex predator like we are in our world. Those are assumptions that it's safe to make about any D&D game ever played. So you going, your world building is probably going to have to take those into account, which means that you, certain demands are made upon you as a DM and certain demands are made upon you as a designer and, a, and an artist. You need to explain the gods you need to explain magic you might want to emphasize certain monsters certain kinds of spells certain kinds of character classes i find i tend to i really like paladin orders i think they're really really interesting so i i, I like to emphasize them you know a, a sort of a jedi knight feel to them and the thing is about that is that over the years and over time you kind of replicate things. You replicate yourself, you replicate others. You know, like I said before, you're going to have a lot of paladins. Paladins tend to be four square, stalwart, heroic types who are sworn to the gods. So you're probably going to make up a god of justice. You're probably going to make up a god of defending the weak. You're probably going to make up a god of magic. You're probably going to make up a god of luck and adventures. You're probably going to make up an evil god. The reason why is because it's useful to have those things. They are constant sources of um, plots and, and intrigue for your game. If All right, one final example before we go. Now, I'm not even a Lord of the Rings fan or a Tolkien fan. Let's not get into it, but... Minds of Moria, especially in the film, is a fantastic example of less is more and why you don't really need to world build all that much. Fantastic bit in Minds of Moria, they get into the dungeon, the Ur dungeon, they read the book, there are drums in the deep, we can't get out. There's that fantastic bit where, you know, Gandalf is looking into the darkness, there's something in those trees, man, and it's not human, we're all going to die. And then, you know, there's the chase sequence that apparently goes on for 400 hours. And then finally, at last, they get to the bridge. There's the Balrog spreading his wings because Balrogs have wings. And Legolas goes, it's a Balrog. 
And I think someone else goes, what's the Balrog? And there's that bit where, you know, McKellen is leaning on his staff and he's like, a demon of the ancient world. And then he does his, I'm going to be late for actor union lunch break. But the important bit is the demon of the ancient world. He doesn't say, demon of the ancient world, who used to serve Melkor, who is called Morgoth, who during the first age recruited the Maya spirits and corrupted them in what seems to be a sort of rip-off of the devil. Then the Balrogs worked as his bodyguards to help him with Angoliant. Then at the Fountain of Bligablug, they did the Frogafing and killed the Shingobar. You know, there's none of that sort of stuff. There's just, it's a demon of the ancient world. And the important thing that happens then is that the Balrog kills the highest level NPC. Immediately, what is important is that there are demons. So there are creatures sort of outside. Sorry, my dog. You'll get fed. So um, that there are demons, that there is an ancient world, and that there are forces in the world that can take out and destroy even what the characters have considered the most powerful of the NPCs that they have met. That is the important part of the Balrog, is that it hints at a huge big other world that you don't need to get into. Um, and it changes the, the, the storyline because the, the head NPC is dead. And then later on, the Balrog's really only importance is that it allows Gandalf to come back to life, which is not good because I'm not really a fan. doesn't matter. Um, the Nazgul are the same. Um, you get the player handouts at the beginning of the, the campaign notes suggest there, there were rings for the elves, there were rings for the dwarves, and there were nine rings for men. And the men were corrupted by the rings and turned into ghosty dudes. What's important is that the ring is important because you know that rings are going to be a thing in the campaign. You were given a ring early on in the campaign. You understand that this is important. The players will understand, yeah, I have a ring. This will probably pay off somewhere down the line. I better keep it. And then the Nazgul will come along and try to take back the ring. So you know who they are. And that's all you need is a context. But what you really know is that moral purity and moral corruption are important parts of the campaign. And that is what the backstory is important to tell you about. It hints at what's going on under the surface of the story. But realistically, the Nazgul are important because they're giant ghost bastards that are riding around in wyverns and they mess you up. That's important. A hint at the backstory creates so much more than there ever would slowing down the narrative to tell you the Witch King of Angmar went to Angmar High School and graduated quite high in his class. Less is more. All right, let's wind this up. So world building, world building isn't a sin. I don't want to, I don't want to overstate that. I think that, you know, it's a mistake to build a world. Like I said at the beginning, it is fun. It is rewarding. It is something that you should do because you like doing it. I do it, but you're going forward. The first session is where everything begins. And if you create too much to bog down the players, and if you create too much to lock the players out of engaging and interacting with your world effectively, which is what 5,000, 10,000 words of backstory can be, you are doing yourself a disservice. What you should be doing is focusing on things in the world right now, stuff happening right now. The plague is happening right now. The dragon lord died right now. The vampire king has returned right now. The goblins are charging at you right now. Everyone's got super herpes because of the herpy goddess right now. That's important. What your real challenge as a DM is, is to make things gameable, is to give hooks to players to do fun things and to let players provide you with hooks for them to do fun things. So we'll build if you like, but it's always going to be secondary to that goal. Now we can talk more and we will talk more in other videos about um, other things that you can do besides world building. I think that creating an aesthetic is the most important thing. 
I think we should talk more about creating emotionally interesting reactive NPCs. And I think that we will leave it here with the encouragement that as a DM, you will succeed. You will be a great DM if you encourage player participation more than anything else. Thanks. We'll see you soon.